and viewers like you. This is the day the Lord has made. We will rejoice and be glad in it. Good morning, everyone. Hello and welcome, church family. It is such a joy to be with you today and to have you here. We love you. And as Helen Keller said, alone we can do so little, but together we can do so much. Thank you for being here. Man, we're just going to begin this morning with a word of prayer. Today we're talking about what it means to love our enemies and to love those who are rude to us, uh, unkind to us. And so we're just gonna pray that God would open up our hearts. And so Father, we come to you in Jesus' name. And for many of us, Lord, who have been hurt or wounded, we recognize that these things are painful, that they harm us, and that you love us and you don't want us to be offended or pushed aside or unnoticed. So, Lord, we pray that when those things happen, we could still respond with love. We pray, God, that we would be overflowing with agape love, that we would love our enemies and even love those who say nasty things about us and that we could find that living in the kingdom of God, we'd just be overflowing with your Holy Spirit and your power. So we're asking for that today. I want you to know that every song we sing, everything we do today is in worship to you. We love you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Turn around and shake the hand of the person next to you and say, God loves you and so do I. This is my prayer in the desert when all that's within me feels dry. This is my prayer in my hunger and need. My God is the God who provides. This is my prayer in the fire, in weakness or trial or pain. There is a faith proved in worth more than gold, so refine me, Lord, through the flame.
in preparation for Bobby's message, Colossians 3.22. Slaves, obey your earthly masters in everything. And do it not only when their eye is on you and to curry their favor, but with sincerity of heart and reverence for the Lord. Whatever you do, work at it with all your heart as working for the Lord, not for human masters, since you know that you will receive an inheritance from the Lord as a reward. It is the Lord Christ you are serving. Anyone who does wrong will be repaid for their wrongs and there is no favoritism. Church family, we are striving to do our work unto the Lord and to love our enemies, even our bosses. <laughs> Amen. keep fighting voices in my mind that say I'm not enough. Every single lie that tells me I will never measure up. Am I more than just the sum of every Thank you for joining us today. I want to encourage you with something that I feel is so important to understanding how God works through your life. I've discovered firsthand that the responsibility and privilege of transforming someone's life belongs to only one person. That one person is you. You see, together, that means you and I joining as one, our call is simply this, to share God's love through His Word and allow it to transform lives. 
Bobby and I are so grateful for you. Each and every day we walk in confidence knowing that we are not alone, that our friends and ministry partners are as passionate as we are in making sure that people hear about the love of Jesus. That love through our ministry is leading people to Christ, helping people overcome bad habits and addictions, equipping people to deal with relational struggles, and showing people that there is absolutely nothing impossible with God. As Hannah shared, and I hope it's obvious to you, we love and care about people, and I know that you do too. This month, we are focusing on our ministry partners, which we call our Eagle and Sparrow Partners. Today, if you haven't yet joined us as a partner, I simply want to ask you to do so. It's a commitment from you to join with us in monthly giving and prayer, and it's a commitment from us to be great stewards of your generosity and to share the love and hope found in God's Word with as many people as we can through all of our broadcasts and ministry outreaches. For those of you who are already joining with us as Eagle and Sparrow Partners, thank you. Please continue to stand with us and consider doing all you can to make this ministry a beacon of light in a world that really needs the love of God. As you join with us today, we have some really special and encouraging resources to help you grow in your relationship with Christ. With your monthly commitment of $50 or more, join us as an Eagle partner, and as our thank you, we will send you our Eagle's Wings mug and coaster set. Plus, come alive, 365 devotionals for abundant living, and a bonus, Living Connected video message by Pastor Bobby. Your Eagle's Wings mug will inspire you each morning as you reflect on the goodness of God and His provision in your life. And with this year-long devotional, you'll find daily encouragement that will truly make you come alive and access the abundant life Jesus came to bring. In addition, you'll receive Living Connected, a special bonus video message from Pastor Bobby on the value of living not only connected with God, but with those around you. Or with your commitment of $20 a month, you can join us as a Sparrow Partner. As our way of saying thank you, we'll send you our Sparrow Scripture Card boxed set. Come Alive 365 Devotionals for Abundant Living and a bonus Living Connected video message by Pastor Bobby. This custom Sparrow Scripture Card boxed set includes 50 Scripture cards that will surely inspire you and help you in your faith walk. Call, write, or go online today and become an Eagle or Sparrow partner. Your partnership will make all the difference. Now, let's return to the service.
My name is Franklin Trummel. I've been coming to Shepherd's Grove since 2012. My mom was a Jehovah's Witness. My father was a, was a Southern Baptist. It was, it was a strange dynamic because uh, we were going to um, Kingdom Hall on Saturdays. And then on Sundays, I'd have to turn around and go to Sunday school at the, the local Baptist church. Mom and Dad got divorced when I was uh, when I was 11 years old, so all church pretty much ended. Went into this foster home at, at 15, and I started going to Calvary Chapel, Costa Mesa. Yeah, the experience itself was really good. I, I liked uh, what was being taught. I, I liked the, the sense of belonging. Um, yeah, it was it was a good feeling. Once I turned 18, all bets were off. Um, I turned my back on the church completely. I, it was just pretty much, um, I was an adult now. So, you know, once I turned 20, after I had gotten divorced, it, the party was on. That's when, that's when it all started. During that time, life was just a matter of, of working during the week and saving up for the weekend. You know, Friday night comes around, you're out going out going out to clubs and doing drugs and just living the life. You know, I, I graduated from just doing the, being the weekend warrior to being a full-time drug addict. You can't just do that on the weekends. That's, that, that controls your life. It's, that's your God. I love the drugs more than I liked any, any, than I liked life itself. I said, that's it, I'm, I can't do this anymore. There's gotta, there's gotta be something better and I'm, God had his hand on me all this time, all that time. Once we found our place, our home at Shepherd's Grove, that's when everything really, really changed for us. I feel like I'm doing what I'm supposed to be doing for once. Instead of tearing myself down and the people around me, I'm actually doing what I'm meant to do, what God had, had intended for me all along. When I think about what the change in me has, has been all about from then till now is insurmountable joy, without a doubt. God saved me from the same thing that I watched so many people die from, just a miserable death and dying alone and with nobody, with no hope. Saved me too, a future where that has tons of hope and joy and just knowing that when I wake up, it's gonna be a good day, no matter what. I have the love of God, man. It's the first time in my life I, I, I smile, you know. I'm, I don't walk around with such a long face all the time. I, I, I can't put it into words sometimes how much it, it's done for me and what it's done for, for me and my marriage and my life, you know. And it's just great.
This month, with your generous gift of any size to Hour of Power, you'll receive our brand new daily devotional, Come Alive, 365 Devotionals for Abundant Living. With this new year-long devotional, you'll find daily encouragement that will truly make you come alive and access the abundant life Jesus came to bring. In addition to this uplifting devotional, you'll also receive a special bonus video message entitled, Living Connected. This unique message from Pastor Bobby will help you discover the value of living connected to God and community to those around you. To receive these uplifting resources, call, write, or go online today. Bobby and Hannah look forward to hearing from you and are believing for God's blessings in your life. Thank you for watching, and remember always, God loves you, and so do we. Friends, would you hold your hands out like this as a way of receiving? We're going to say this creed together. I'm not what I do. I'm not what I have. I'm not what people say about me. I am the beloved of God. It's who I am. No one can take it from me. I don't have to worry. I don't have to hurry. I can trust my friend Jesus and share his love with the world. Thanks. You can be seated. Well, today's sermon is called Love Your Enemies, Even Your Boss. <laughs> and uh, some of us have great bosses. Some of us have great colleagues. Man, I tell you, there's nothing better than working for a really inspiring, life-giving, you know, kind, fair boss. There's nothing better than working 
in a job with people you love, people you enjoy seeing, uh, working in an organi organization that's inspiring. But very often, many of us, probably most of us, have at least one or two people in our, our jobs or in our workplaces that are, are not a joy to be with. We want to talk about how to deal with that spiritually and how to be loving, life-giving believers and how to let all this stuff that weighs us down in our discipleship, how to let it go. This is in the context of a new series we started last week called Avodah. Avodah is this idea that my work is my worship, is my service. In Hebrew, it's all the same word. So in Hebrew, there isn't, the, the word for worship is the word for work, is the word for service. So for example, when, uh, when Adam and Eve are called to Avad and Shamar the garden, that word Avad is from Avodah, and and it means that the work that Adam does and work that Eve does in the garden is also their worship to God and it's also their service to one another. And so if you translate the Bible, and we had to do this often in seminary, you have to kind of choose as a translator how you're going to translate it because in English, we don't have a word like avodah. We section it off. Our work is this thing that stinks and it's over here. And our worship is this thing that's music and it happens at church. And our service is the thing that we volunteer to do in our free time. And I would just suggest that all three of those things are damaged when, they set, when we separate them and think of them differently. And you can see the evidence of that. Over 60% of Americans don't like their jobs or even hate their jobs. Like 12% or 15% I think actually do hate their jobs, which leaves about 20, 25% of people that truly enjoy going to their jobs. That means if you enjoy and love your work and love your colleagues and love your boss, you're in the minority, you're lucky. And so we want to talk about how we can make our lives joyful when we go to work in, on Monday morning. How, how every single day can be full of the kingdom of God, full of life, full of joy. How we can find meaning in our rest, meaning in our work, and meaning in our hobbies, in our service, in our volunteering, in our generosity. And I think that it's found within this one word, avodah. I hate to quote Nietzsche, but Nietzsche said that within every language there was a philosophy. And it seems very clear to me that in Hebrew there is this this, this idea that God loves our work. That when we work with all our heart, when we work as though we're serving God and not just man, when we work as though all of our work has eternal value somehow in some way in God's great plan, something changes. Our work becomes better, becomes worthwhile. Our week becomes more joyful. But there's a million reasons why it's wisdom to perceive your work, your daily work, as worship and to perceive your work as service that it's a gift to others and an act of worship to God, this word avodah. So one of the things I want to tackle, as I mentioned before, is, okay, fine, last week we talked about kind of how to do that, but what about when we have to work with people that are annoying or difficult or unfair, when people steal our staplers and log into our computer and, uh, you know, send us spam emails from people that bug us or gossip about us. What about bosses, unfair bosses, bosses that don't promote us or give us raises or hear us or threaten to fire us, uh, bosses that uh, play favorites or colleagues that take credit. Many of these have happened to us. Some of us aren't working anymore, so what do we do with our, when you're volunteering or, or working in a church or, or doing the various things that we do in our clubs and our, our communities and we have you know, leaders of those clubs or people that we work with that are just rude or unfair or, or seem like they're out to get us. And Jesus has an answer to that. And the answer is when we do our work, to do it as though we're doing it for the Lord and to even, yeah, love our enemies. To love our enemies, to love our enemies, even our bosses. What do we do in life when we have to work with, in, in ministry we call them EGRs, extra grace required. You know, what do we do when we, when we have EGRs that we, we see every day? How do we work with them? And, and the answer is, we love them. We love them. We love people. That is, that is the central characteristic of a true disciple of Jesus Christ. If, uh, if I speak in tongues of angels, right? But I have not love. I'm a clinging gong. Look, love is the thing that defines what it means to be a believer. Very often when we, when we talk about loving our, our neighbor, or in fact loving our enemies, we often talk about it in the sense of, like, just try harder. You know, just do your best to love them. And although that's sure better than nothing, it's, it's not something that will last forever. 
What we talk about when we talk about loving our enemies is a total transformation that happens through the Holy Spirit where we become a new creation and we become a loving person. This is an important part and can't be missed of this. And I, I, I've preached a whole series on this in our last series called Life Without Lack. But in it, I talk about Dallas Willard's, um, uh, tri- I think he calls it a triad of sufficiency. And, it's, and it, he ties together all these beautiful scriptures where the journey of the disciple into becoming a new creation looks like this. First, it's faith. Trusting that I don't need to set my enemy straight. Trusting that if I love my enemy and I say good things about them and I care for them, that it's not my job to fix it, that God will take care of it. And that if I'm obedient to him in love to my enemies, that God can do something great through that. The next step is death to self, not death of self. It's not that I don't matter. It's not that it didn't hurt. It's not that my feelings aren't, aren't important or that I don't feel stress. But it's saying, I am, I'm going to not make it all about my ego. I'm going to stop saying, how dare you? And I'm offended and this isn't right. By the way, this is very difficult for me, for me, Bobby Shuler. Yesterday, a hamburger guy was giving Hannah a hard time because she asked what sort of meat was in it. He was like, it's all the same meat. And I wanted to be like, oh, oh man, I started feeling it bubble up. <laughs> and uh, I will say that, that, that I just didn't say anything, which was, I'm very proud of. This is better than nothing. You know, it's better than nothing. And that was coming from a place of welfare. But there's this idea of death to self that we can let this stuff go. Like, what do we have to prove to a hamburger guy? What do we have to prove to the person that cuts in front of us at, at the bank? Or, or the person that brings 16 items to the 15 items or less part of the grocery store? Like, why do we have to set those people straight? And the answer is because we have these, these inflated egos. And it, and it touches on all the other ways that people have violated, you know, bigger, more important boundaries. So, so this part of faith and trusting God is saying, okay, I can let my ego go and trust that God has the, the best for me at its right time. And then the third thing is that when you begin to do that, that is faith and death to self, from, from the inside and through the Holy Spirit comes this thing we call agape love. It's just, it's not even that you do your best to love people, you just over time become a loving person. We know those people, don't we? They just are bubbling over with compassion and love. They're, they're quick to mercy. They're kind. They're, they're easygoing. And I don't, think it, I don't think that's a personality type. I think that's something you can become. It's easier for some of us than others. It's, it's harder for those of us who are Irish, for example. <laughs> I'm 50% Irish. It's very difficult. But even we can do it. So we learn to love our enemies by becoming a loving person. There are lots of places where... The scriptures teach about this. It's all throughout the scripture, but it's, of course, central. It's probably the central theme, one of the central themes of Jesus' Sermon on the Mount. Now, there are a lot of churches that refuse to teach on loving your enemies, and I don't understand why. I, I, I heard my favorite preacher. I listen to his sermons every week. I won't say who he is, because, and, and what do I know? But I mean, I, I heard him say that the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus doesn't expect us to actually do the Sermon on the Mount. The Sermon on the Mount is just there to show us what perfection looks like and to show us what we'll never achieve, that we as sinners, you know, need forgiveness. I'm like, it doesn't say that. You just made that up. When you actually look at the end of the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus actually says, anyone who hears these words of mine and puts them into practice is like a man or woman who builds their house on the rock hears these words of mine and puts them into practice. So this is what I want to say, is that what Jesus teaches in the Sermon on the Mount, he intends for us to do, including loving our enemies. And furthermore, we don't do it out of piety or duty or some you know, huge sense of holiness, but rather it's good advice. It's useful. It's practical. It makes your life better to love your enemies. When you love your enemy, loving your enemies, listen to me, is one of the best ways you can show God you trust him with your life. It takes a lot of faith to not set your enemy straight, to trust that the turning of the cheek, the going of the extra mile that Jesus teaches us is an act of faith that changes lives and and erodes the kingdom of darkness with light. We're gonna talk a little more about that. Jesus teaches, if if you have no idea what I'm talking about, I'm glad. Uh, This is what Jesus says. 
You know, you've heard that it was said, eye for an eye and tooth for a tooth. But I tell you, do not resist an evil person. If someone strikes you on the right cheek, turn to him the other also. And if someone wants to sue you and take your tunic, give him your cloak as well. If someone forces you to go a mile, go with him two miles. Give to the one who asks of you and do not turn away from the one who wants to borrow from you. So first, let's talk about turning the other cheek. I'd like to invite my very intelligent, very cool-headed, awesome wife, <laughs> Hannah, my best friend. Thank you. Hannah. Mm -hmm. um, okay, so this is, this, when Jesus says, uh, if someone strikes you on the right cheek, he's talking about an insult. That's a backhanded slap, and this is how we know so in Hebrew culture, Hannah's going to be the slapper, and I'm, she's going to be the bully, and I'm going to be the one who's being bullied. Mm -hmm. The victim. But I'm six foot three, and you're not, so we're going to give you a mustache. There you go. Are you tougher? This is going to make it look All like right. a bully rather than my wife is just angry at me for something. Is that Terrific. good? Yes. Is that good? Yes. Is this helping? All right. Hannah's the tough guy, and I'm the mm -hmm. one that's being bullied. And uh, so in Jewish culture in the first century, you don't use your, hand, your left hand in public for anything, right? Unless you're holding something with both hands. So you don't point with your left hand, for example. You don't write with your left hand. And you don't slap with your left hand. Everything you do, you do with the hand of power mm -hmm. in, in the cultures with the right hand. So if somebody strikes me on the right cheek, try and slap me open-handed with your right hand on my right cheek. No, open-handed. It's just, it Wait, doesn't, I mean, oh, feel yeah. like it doesn't... <laughs> You don't have to actually do it. I mean, but to show. <laughs> you did it. Yeah, it's awkward. It is awkward. Yeah. The way you do it is with the back of your hand. See the, mm -hmm. So there we go. <laughs> thank you, Hannah. Did she great? Thank you, Hannah. That's it. I just yeah. needed somebody to see that. So what happens is in, in, in the culture, uh, slapping someone on the right cheek is an insult. It's the backhanded slap. And so when Jesus, so the, the, this is important. This is not as much about violence as it is offense. It's about, because many of us, we don't really experience violence that often, but how many of you have been offended in the last month? How many of you have been offended in the last 30 minutes? <laughs> Look, it happens all the time. And there, there are ways in which, there are ways in which we, people intentionally and publicly insult us. And in a way, it is violent, isn't it? It's not violent. So it's almost like to reveal it, Jesus says, turn to them the other also. So, oh, I already had you sit down. It was too late. But when you turn the left cheek, it now, the only way to strike the person would be to punch them or to sort of open-handed, you know, cuff their jaw, which turns an insult into violence. Isn't that crazy? So Jesus is almost saying, it's, it's the first teaching of nonviolence that when you, you are you know, being offended or harmed or something unjust has happened, it's like our, our temptation is fight or flight, right? Flight, run away or tuck tail, yes sir, whatever you want, sir. Or to fight, how dare you, I'm going to get you. But this is the first time of what happens if, especially in a face culture, a culture of honor, a military culture, you merely stand your ground and turn the cheek and force the person to strike you in a real way. And in, in a military first century culture, if the person struck you, that would be almost a way of saying, we're peers now. It would be like elevating you, as strange as that sounds. And most of all, it would confuse the person and very often cause everybody else watching to see who's right and who's wrong. All of this is only possible when you recognize that you're living in the kingdom of God. That no matter how, how much you're harmed, no matter how much somebody insults you, you are protected by the Most High God, that he loves you, he's got your back, he's got the best in front of you, and if you obey him and serve him and, and do what Jesus teaches, that it's wisdom, that the best is going to happen. So this is how we, t so one of the questions we ask ourselves, how many of us have been backhanded? Probably none of us, and, and uh, maybe one or two, but most of us, we have been insulted. So we have to ask this question, how do we find a way as believers when we're insulted to neither run away and cower, nor strike back and say, well, you're this and you're that and I blah, 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 or fight or whatever. How do we find a way to sort of nonviolently stand our ground? Jesus then says, uh, if someone takes your tunic, give them your cloak as well. Well, this is a guy that's maybe been sued for everything. He's out of money. The tunic, by the way, people didn't really have 
underwear, I hate to say that in the way that we think of it today, a typical first century man had a tunic and a cloak. The tunic is like a, it's like a man muumu. It's like, that's the main undergarment, it's kind of their underwear, and it goes over, just kind of think of like a white sheet that would just kind of be very comfortable and would keep the sweat and everything from making the outer garment dirty. So then they would put a clo- you know, the cloak on over that, it's like a robe type thing. And so there were cases where in order to humiliate someone who was poor, uh, this, you know, the plaintiff would uh, you know, ask for the person's underwear effectively, ask for their tunic. And Jesus says, if they try to do that, just take your tunic, just give them your cloak, just give them everything, hand it over to them, and just stand there naked. And this idea is that if you live in the kingdom of God and the sufficiency of God, you can handle that. And by doing that, this is prophetic way of showing how unjust and unfair this thing is. It's, again, not fight, not flight. It's nonviolence. And finally, the third example he uses is, if someone forces you to go a mile, go with him two miles. Two miles. In Jesus' day, Roman soldiers, this is probably what it's a reference to, would very often be walking down the road with their heavy pack holding, you know, armor or whatever is in it, and they would see some random person walking and say, hey, you, take this, you know, oi, you, boy, take this. And uh, I don't know why Roman soldiers always have an English accent. Cogni, they always do, especially the bad guys. Anyway, and they'd force some random Palestinian to sort of carry this pack a mile, and he says, if, you, if they ask you to carry it a mile, carry it two miles. What if in response to the injustice of a soldier forcing you to carry it, you decide that this is not going to be injustice, this is going to be hospitality? You just decide that, no, I'm going to carry it as much as I can, and I'm going to be loving to this person, even though he's been a total jerk to me. So in a world, a free world like Rome was for many Roman citizens, not for everyone, we're going to get to slaves in just a minute, but in the Roman world where it's mostly free, as long as you follow, you know, it was common when somebody was unkind to you or unfair to you to to power up. When one person powers up, well, I power up back. I escalate it. And Jesus is teaching us, no. What if you find this way to show this this hurt person, this hurting person, that that there's a better way to deal with things? And so this was revolutionary, awesome, wonderful. It was central to the first century church, second and third century church, and made all the difference in the world. And what we have to ask as disciples is when somebody powers up against us, how do we be, like nobody's going to ask you to carry a pack a mile, but somebody might cut in front of you in line at Disneyland. How do we both not ignore something and also not fight back? How do we find that way in which I love this person, and I find a prophetic way to show them that they are loved, even though they're trying to convey to me that I don't matter. How do we respond to comments on Facebook and Instagram and Twitter? And those of you who go on, like, the OC Register comment section or whatever, and you battle back and forth. I mean, is that stuff helping us? Is the powering up and proving and all, is it helping us? What happens if you get a bad server, right? A really bad server, never fills up your water, dirty silverware, took forever to sit you down. Most of us, we're not going to leave a tip. No, some of us are going to leave a tip. The, really, the ones of us that are really good, we're going to leave a penny to make sure that they didn't think I just forgot. We just want them to know, here's a penny, because that's what your service <laughs> was worth. <laughs> Nothing. What would happen if you got really bad service from someone and it was really bad and maybe you even said something and and then there's some awkward tension and instead of leaving no tip you leave the biggest tip you've ever left like a gigantic 40 percent tip a 50 percent 100 percent tip what if you did that i know those of you who who are kind of like me a little bit dutch that's the other half one half is irish the other half is dutch <laughs> It's just like, the idea is just like, oh, it's galling, it's horrible. But what would happen if you did that? What if the Holy Spirit told you to do that? And what if you were able to change that person's life by leaving a giant tip? What would happen if somebody at work said something horrible about you and you forgave them and said something kind to them or about them? What would happen if somebody stole something from you at work and you gave them something else? 
This is when like Jean Valjean, he has his silvers taken and, and the police come back with, with Jean Valjean and the priest gives him the candlesticks as well. And he says, with this I have bought your soul. We forget that love of our enemies is not about us. It's about changing their lives. It's about inviting them to a new reality where they, they are loved, despite what they do, that they matter. I think it was Rick Warren that said, hurting people hurt people. And what happens if we just decide that no matter how hurtful they're going to be, we're going to find a way to show that in the kingdom of God, even people like that are loved? See, it's, it's not about us. It's not about proving ourselves. It's not about our ego. It's about inviting people into the kingdom of God. And this finally gets to, to where we are um, in, in our work. Now, this idea totally transformed the Roman Empire in a world where slaves were property and they were mistreated and you had patricians at the top, senators and the wealthy and, you had, and everybody you know, was at different levels. You found in the church a place where senators who had just become Christians were hugging slaves, serving them communion, washing their feet. This was something nobody had ever heard of. In a Roman Empire where orphans were thrown out on the street to be, to be enslaved or abused, in a world where the elderly um, were oftentimes abandoned, where the sick were oftentimes euthanized, the church emerged as this community that said, just give us everyone. They continued to love their enemies. They continued to love one another. And there are many historians, secular and Christian, that believe it was this and this alone that truly undid the Roman Empire from the inside out. An empire that was so shallow, so competitive, that a community that decided to love their enemies and care for the outcast undid it all through compassion and kindness. And that is so defining, so defining of what it means to be a believer. So when Paul is writing in Colossians, I like to pick the most, this, this passage that we're about to read, Colossians 3, verse 22 before this, Paul paints this beautiful picture of what the life of a disciple is. And actually, again, Dallas Willard taught that this would, if we were to memorize any Bible verse, this would be the one we should memorize, is Colossians actually 3, 1 through 17. But what I'm going to read is the one that just comes after that, the very controversial passage that says, Slaves, obey your masters. Now, this is a, especially today, horrifying thing to read uh, out of context. It was actually used, this passage, uh, in the South during the pre-Civil War America by uh, pastors to sort of teach that slaves were a part of God's this or that. And of course, as Satan does, he likes to use some of the best passages uh, to twist them around and turn them into something uh, evil. Uh, God does not, slavery is not okay in the scriptures. Sla slavery is evil, and horrible, it degenerates the person. In fact, in the Jewish tradition, the first commandment is actually... Uh, I am the Lord you, your God who brought you out of Egypt, out of the land of slavery. And so Jews actually teach that the first commandment is that we have a free will and that we ought to honor the dignity of every single person. So the Roman Empire, by the way, most of their slaves were probably Celtic. So the irony of the southern thing, I'm going off, aren't I? I'm going too much on this thing. But the point is merely... That, that Paul himself is suffering injustice. He's writing from prison as a Roman citizen. He's probably put there because he just ticked off the wrong guy and he's pro his rights are being violated. And as a Roman citizen, he would have had rights. He is writing to slaves, most of whom are Christians. And he is giving them this advice. He says, slaves, obey your earthly masters and everything. Now, is he saying slavery is okay? Absolutely not. He is saying that despite its that it's horrible and awful, etc., obey them. Uh, and do it not only when their eye is on you uh, to win favor, but with sincerity of heart and reverence for the Lord. Next one. I'm going to read, I think my translation's off. Whatever you do, work at it with all your heart as though working for the Lord and not for earthly masters. Uh... And not for men. Since you know that you will receive an inheritance from the Lord as a reward, it is the Lord Christ you are serving. Anyone who does wrong, now hear this, anyone who does wrong will be repaid for his wrong, and there is no favoritism. In other words, in the kingdom of God, if you do wrong, you're, you're going to be punished. You're, these masters, let God deal with them. 
Don't try and overthrow them. Don't try and prove your point. Trust that even though this is unfair and unjust, work at it with all your heart. And this is a huge gift Paul is giving these people. It makes me think that it reminds me very much of the time when uh, uh, Viktor Frankl was writing from the concentration camps. He was a Jew who was uh, unfairly in prison. And he said, the one thing they can't take away from me is my ability to choose how I will respond. Paul knows that he's not going to, he's not supposed to charge uh, the slaves in the church to create some kind of slave army to you know, overthrow their masters. He knows that's not realistic, but instead, if he, he gives them this gift, that if they work at it with all their heart, that if they love their enemies, even their masters, that God will show them favor and miracles will come from that, and they might even change the heart of their masters. All of this to say, what does this have to do with our work? Well, if, if first century slaves can love people who are beating them and harming them and putting them in chains, and they did, and if Paul in prison can love his prison guards even when they curse him and spit on him and throw stuff on him, and if Jesus Christ can love the people who crucified him unfairly and mocked him and beat him and called him the king of the Jews and dressed him up and, 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 and hung him on a cross naked. And if he could say in that time, forgive them, Father, for they know not what they do. You can love your boss when he asks you to work on a Saturday last minute. You can love a colleague who takes the credit. You can love the guy who... who cuts in front of you at the airport or takes a seat unfairly or tells your wife that it's silly for her to ask what kind of meat is in a hamburger. We can become the kinds of people who decide that it's just not about our ego anymore and that what if this is an opportunity? Because, you know, here's the thing. Rude people are rude to everybody. And in almost every case, people are going to power up against them. It is so rare for that rude person to have a true disciple of Christ love them, even though they're being unloving. And what I want to say to you most of all is that when we do this, it's practical, it's wise, and it builds up a tremendous amount of favor with God. I just purely believe that when you do good and when you do what is right, especially when you do it, even when your boss isn't looking, when you do what is good, that God will bless you for that in the long run, that somehow it will always work out um, in your favor. Trust it to the Lord. Trust that you don't have to set your enemies right, that God will do it, and that if you, you are good in your workplace, your neighbor, and you love people, it's just so good in the, in the end. God's proud of you. He sees what you've done. We can all do better. Don't beat yourself up. You're doing better than you think, and uh, we'll get there in the end. Lord, we thank you, and we love you. Father, I just pray for anybody under the sound of my voice who has an unfair boss or a horrible colleague it's really hard to work with. Lord, we just pray in Jesus' name that you would teach us to forgive and love them. Uh, if there's something evil or unfair or something like that, Lord, we do. I, I just want to encourage everyone who's listening. If, if there's something, I'll make sure you report you know, bad bosses and stuff, but. Outside of that, people that are annoying or unfair, Lord, we just pray in Jesus' name. You'd help us to love them. Lord, we thank you. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. As I was praying, this thought came to me about what I was preaching on, and I just wanted to sort of add an addendum. And that is, if you're in a place where a boss is doing something illegal or abusive, that it is loving to report that person. Because when you do that, you are helping your colleagues. So I was just thinking, like, I don't want people here to think that if there's, you know, sexual abuse or things like that or, or discrimination, et cetera. But I do want to say, again, we love our bosses and the more normative, annoying type things. I hope that goes without being said. And now the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord lift his countenance upon you and give you his peace. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen.
The preceding program was paid for by the ministry partners of the Hour of Power and viewers like you and is accredited by the Evangelical Council for Financial Accountability.